Thank you very much, Martin. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for this wonderful invitation and mostly to meet most of you and get to know you better and to learn more about Lee Lorch. Hey, I really regret that I never actually met the man, um, but I'm inspired by the echoes of his presence amongst the people here. So um, today I'm going to talk to you about this poster, which I designed and built some years ago. Uh, trying to remember exactly when we printed it. I think it was probably 2006. Uh, this is, uh, it was paid for by Gaston Gonet at the uh, uh, ETH in Zurich. Uh, MapleSoft also had some part in it, uh, but the work was uh, done at the University of Western Ontario. Um, there are a million things on this poster. It was inspired, I was inspired to do this poster by the Mathematica Solving the Quintic poster, which uh, Oleg brought. Uh, that's all been snapped up now. And it was meant to be given away. It's meant to be given away to uh, uh, anybody who wanted some, so feel free to take them. It, but it's a bit awkward to carry, but, so don't feel that you have to take it away. You can download a, a PDF version at the website at the bottom and print it locally wherever you want. You're allowed to fold it. You're allowed to fold it if you like, and iron it too. Um, okay, so part of the problem with giving a talk on Lambert W is there's so much to say. I don't give very many talks on Lambert W. It's uh, uh, about maybe 10 to 15 percent of my papers are on Lambert W, and it accounts for about 65 percent of my citations. So maybe I should spend more time <laughs> on it. Clearly, it's very rewarding, but it's leaders and administrators who care about the citation counts. That's metrics that give, gets them promoted. They say, "Look at what my underlings can do." That's not necessarily what we want to do. But anyway, um, what is the Lambert W function? Uh, anybody who encounters uh, Maple and asks Maple to solve an equation is likely to run into it. If they use Mathematica, they'll get an answer in terms of the equivalent, completely equivalent form product log. And there's a story behind that, but I'm not going to bother. I'll, you can ask me at coffee about, uh, about that. So we begin with a really simple function, just y equals x times e to the x. And it has a nice, uh, easy derivative to uh, think about that. Oh, by the way, it's not only a rare thing to get a chalk talk, it's a rare thing to be able to give one. Fields Institute is one of the few places where you can. I have eight boards to, to work with here and colored chalk. I'm drunk with power. It's wonderful. Um, okay, so we have... Uh, uh, this simple function, first year calculus exercise to sketch it. The derivative is zero when x equals minus one. When x equals minus one, the value is minus one over e. Um, grows like the exponential, and it, uh, as x goes to negative infinity, it decays to zero, comes up under nicely. So if we want to draw the inverse function, we all know how to do that. There's a slightly easier way to do it than what I'm going to do now, but I've decided that I'm going to be standard. Okay, the graph of the inverse function, we interchange x and y, so we just have x is equal to y e to the y, and then the derivative, just easy by implicit differentiation, uh, we see that the graph of the inverse function looks vaguely like a logarithm out there, has a branch point at x equals minus 1 over e, the value is minus 1, and in this range in here, there are two values of y for any given x. So this must have a branch. So we must have a different branch here. So it's like the cook in the cooking shows. You always have something pre-prepared, right? Um, <laughs> This is the notation for uh, Lambert W branches. So this is the kth branch of the Lambert W function. And by convention, we take the zeroth branch, the principal branch, to be the one whose value is larger than minus one. So that's, in particular, that's the only branch that takes on positive real values. 
Um, and if we just leave off the subscript, then it's just the principal branch. It turned out that we want to call the one whose values are negative, or smaller than minus one, we want to call it the uh, minus one branch. The branch numbering, we'll come back to that in a bit. Real, obviously there are complex values. In particular, i times pi over two to the times e to the i times pi over two is i pi over two times i is minus pi over two. So some branch of w of minus pi over two is i times pi over two. And that's minus pi over two is smaller than minus one over e. So yeah, the, it has to be a complex branch. In fact, it turns out that's the zero branch, the principal value of uh, w evaluated at minus pi over 2 gives you plus i times pi over 2. Uh, another value uh, some branch of w when you apply it to 2 pi i k you get exactly back 2 pi i k. That's because 2 pi i k times e to the 2 pi i k, oh, that's 1. Is, so, it's just, so this is a fixed point of some branch. It's going to turn out that it's the fixed point of the kth branch. That's, in some sense, why these branches have the numbers that they do. Okay. Uh, I said that looks sort of like the logarithm. We're going to need to under, just refresh our memories on the complex logarithm in order to understand the branch numbering for Lam, uh, Lambert W. Well, um, we've already seen in several talks today that logarithm is now standardized. Uh, it used to be the case that whenever you said, oh, well, logarithm uh, ln of z is the log of the magnitude of z plus i theta that people would argue. The theta needn't be in that range. But in fact, the ubiquity of computers nowadays says that, yeah, we're, we're all done. Mathematica chooses that range. Maple chooses that range. Fortran, the C standard, uh, everybody. And no one uses Riemann, sur Riemann uh, surfaces to compute with. Oleg said in his talk that he did not believe that there ever would be computation with Riemann surfaces except in specialized uh, situations, and I agree completely. It's just too difficult, and it doesn't do what you want anyway. Um, all right, here's a refinement. Here's a new notation that's been invented by my colleague David Jeffrey. If I used log subscript k, everybody would know that I meant log to the base k. But for ln, no, that's a natural log, base e. The subscript here, what could that be? That's just a branch. Okay, so this, this is a very handy uh, notation for which branch of the logarithm that you want. It's, just, it's rare that there's a spot available in mathematics for a subscript to go that nobody's used before. Uh, this is, as I said, that's David's. And I wholly agree with that. Um, we're going to need a little bit more help. We're going to need a, a big K, uh, the unwinding number. And the definition of this is z minus log of e to the z divided by 2 pi i, which is also equal to the imaginary part of z minus pi divided by 2 pi. What? z minus log of e to the z is not zero? No, it's not. Once you restrict to this range here, you take the exponential of something that loses the phase information. You take the logarithm. You just get the, this part. If you want to fix it up to make it work again, you have to include what we call the unwinding number. So the log, pardon me, let me write it the correct way. Z is equal to the log of e to the z plus 2 pi i 
times the unwinding number of z. It's just bookkeeping. But it's nice to have a formula. More pre-cooked things. This is the standard domain of the logarithm. So we have a branch cut uh, on the negative real axis. The choice of closing it at pi means we're closed on the top. It's called counterclockwise closure. Uh, Velvel Kahan, in this wonderful paper, Much Ado About Nothing, signed it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, pretty much articulated the standard that was evolving at the time. So here's the ranges of logarithm. And in here we have the, I'm going to call it the zero branch in here. Oh, I got to use my color chalk. And I had, in fact, chosen my colors. Um, maybe I'll save it for a little bit. Everything in here with attachment on the top. That's what these bars mean. They we're attaching it on the top. Uh, is the range of the ordinary logarithm. The unwinding number is zero in this strip. The unwinding number is one in this strip. The unwinding number is minus one in this strip. And so on as we go up. All right. Uh, I am delighted to tell you that the unwinding number has been taken up in the matrix function community. So the unwinding number actually turns out to be important in computing the logarithm of a matrix. So there's a, a student of Nick Hyam, uh, Mary Abrahamian, who's working on uh, implementing this in a very nice way. So uh, the, it's connected to the matrix sector function too, but we'll, we might get back to that. Now, I'm on board five, which is, actually I'm not. Uh, <clears throat> I'm on board six. So, the other ugly thing about these, this phase uh, restriction is some of the things that we know are true are not. Josh Billings is credited with saying, it's not what we don't know that hurts us, it's what we know that just ain't so. So everybody wants to write, but it's not true. And why is that true? It's because this is equal to the log of e to the log a times e to the log b. And it's certainly true that when you multiply two exponentials together, their exponents add. That's, that's okay. Now we've got log of an exponential. Oh, we have to use that rule. If we use log of the exponential is this thing minus 2 pi i k. Of, uh, so that's the rule for summing logarithms. Oh. You wouldn't, I trip over that all the time. I know better, right? I know this rule, and I just, oh. Powers are defined as usual. Okay, but now that's the principal log, so that's B log A minus 2 pi I. K of B log A. If b is smaller than 1 in magnitude, that's okay. The unwinding number is 0 because logarithm fits in here, and the unwinding number is 0 in, for, in this region. If b is plus 1, we just fit. If b is minus 1, it doesn't. We get, the, we get a closure on the bottom one, and we have to worry about one uh, thing in there. Uh, one more rule, z squared to the one-half is uh, e to the um, two log z to the one-half, which is e to the one-half log 
of e to the 2 log z. And you can work that out. That's z times e to the minus pi i k of 2 log z. And that fixes up the sign in changing the, the, the square root. So this is a rule that allows automatic computation looking after the, the branch cuts. This function here, e to the minus pi i k 2 log z, is an example of the sector function. If we had nth powers there, we wind up with a tiny little wedge in there. And that's, uh, as I said earlier, important in matrix computations. Now, I'm not going there yet. I want to, uh, I know, I've missed a word. Look at that. I already did that one. That's the, okay, moral, first moral of chalkboard talks, don't forget which, which ones you've done already. So I'd already done, them. did I get it right? Yeah, look at that. Um, well, this board is now redundant. So we will uh, keep it there because that's a good place to keep it. And I'll reuse this board. What I want to do now is look at the images of the negative real axis. We got the... I want to look at the images of the negative real axis under the forward map, uh, x e to the x. So let's just do that in a, a complex way. So uh, I'm now going to think about complex values of y, I'll call it w here, and z will be x plus i y. So doing the y one first, I'm going to look at the curve defined by um, the imaginary part of this, which works out to be e to the u times v cosine v plus u sine v, and I'm going to set that to zero. I also want the x part to be negative. but x is going to be a parameter in there. But if this is equal to 0, then we can solve this. We can solve this for u because it's linear in u once we throw away the, the e to the u. So you get u is equal to minus v cosine v divided by sine v. So that's the same thing as u is equal to cotangent v. equals minus v cotangent v. So the second equation then, well, we plug in u equals minus v cotangent v, we get e to the minus v cotangent v times minus v cotangent v times cosine v minus v sine v equals x. And you simplify that, and you wind up getting x is equal to minus v cosecant v e to the minus v cotangent v. <sighs> now we have to decide for which v x is negative. Turns out that for minus pi less than v less than pi, it's negative. So I'll draw that curve. Yeah, 
Those intersections, that's minus pi over 2, that's plus pi over 2. Um, W0 of minus pi over 2 was equal to i pi over 2. I want this one on the 0 branch. I'm going to close this range up here. And now I get to use the color chalk. Yay. Okay. That's the range of W0. Except that, as I say, I'm going to close it on, on the top here. Never quite gets to the closure of the logarithm, but it fits inside the range for the logarithm. And that's actually important. This is minus 1 here. Um, <coughs> what about the other branches? Well, I have to get this right. Um, 0 up to 2 pi. There's 2 pi there. And I have to go through there. And everything above the axis is in the range of W1. Let's do like that. And asymptotically, the range matches with the log 1. Not down here, but up there matches with the range of log 1. Uh, and again, we close it on the top. W minus 1 includes some real values. And it's the only other branch that does. And there it is. Minus 2 pi. So that's minus 1. And I should write 1. OK, I've just given you a complete recipe for partitioning the W plane in terms of uh, uh, its ranges. So every single value in the W plane fits in one and only one of these ranges. Okay. So if you give me a number in here, I can tell you which branch it's in. And just compare it to one of these curves. All right. Um, who cares about these things? Delay differential equations, one of the first places where people started actually using the complex values. Uh, Sir Edward Maitland Wright solved a number of uh, delay differential equations using essentially this, although he didn't name it. So the W. I think is accidentally appropriate because Wright did so much work on this. It's the same Wright of Hardy and Wright. Uh, the history of the function itself goes back to Euler. Um, Lambert did not know it. Lambert had a series by which Euler used to derive the, the function. Lambert solved the trinomial equation. Euler let some parameters flow together and solved the transcendental equation. So that's that's the prehistory of it. I've had a number of people walk up to me over the, over the years since we published the paper and say, I discovered that long before you did. I just didn't name it. That's true. Uh, Don Knuth published a paper in 1989 with uh, Boris Patel called, uh, called a Recurrence Related to Trees. And in there, he had a, a notation for the function, called it the T. It's slightly different. Well, it's different signs, but otherwise it's completely equivalent. Uh, but he didn't put anybody's name on it. And he didn't trace the history all the way back to, to Euler. And later, when we discussed it with him, he had a pile of notes this big on the thing. Uh, he agreed that naming it after Lambert was okay. Uh, and then we've included some of the, the other material in some of our other papers since then. But this is the way that it looks so far. Um, this, these curves were known since antiquity. That's the quadratics of Hippias. You can use it to uh, square the circle. You can use it to trisect, trisect the angle. 
So you know thereby that you can't construct these curves with <laughs> ruler and straight edge. You need some artful thing. As far as I know, you can't duplicate the cube with it. But two out of three is not bad, right? Uh, so, yeah, 460 BC. It's kind of, that's pushing it as far as, uh, it's the earliest curve for which we have a name associated, which is, which is kind of neat. Um, I'm sorry, Michael, what was that? Uh, it's actually on the poster. Hippias of Ellis is right there. So in, drawn in much better colors than I managed on the board. Um, I will say one more thing about values of uh, Lambert W. So suppose we want WK of some A and A is uh, in minus one over E zero. Then W zero has a value. It's in the, the range there where W zero has a real value. So it goes on the axis. W minus one has a value. And all the other values occur on the lines that I've drawn. They're the images of the negative real axis. And the question is where? I'm going to do that one there and complex conjugate. And then the next ones are back here. And the next ones are farther back. And the next ones are farther back still. You get a, a it comes out in a, in a swan curve that looks very much like the wings of the Sega curve that we saw in the previous talk, which is not an accident because that's what it is. It just, it's the same function, z e to the 1 minus z, magnitude equals 1. We'll just choose a different magnitude on there and flip the signs, and you'll have the things going out this way instead of going out that way. Okay. So there is a picture of that, uh, of these curves. There's the little circle curve on, uh, on there. That appeared, that gray star coffee mug. Any of you have a Department of Applied Math coffee mug, keep, keep on to it because the, the company that made them went out of business, so you can't get them anymore. Um, okay. The location of these points was important for delay differential equations. You could solve delay differential equations by a kind of non-harmonic Fourier series. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna let that slide because it's taken me longer to get started than I thought. Um, the kth branch of Lambert W has a known asymptotic series. Let me, I don't think I need this guy anymore. Just give that asymptotic series. The other reason that I don't get to do chalk talks all that much is that I'm very hard on chalk. I break them all the time. So this is the exponential generating function for the Stirling cycle numbers. Everybody in here knows more about them than I do. Uh, Lambert W k of z is log k of z minus log of log z k, log k, only one k there. That's the principal branch log. But the interior one has a kth branch on it. Plus the sum n bigger than equal to one, 
all of this stuff. We have log k to the z, uh, log k of z to the n on the bottom, and log logs on top. This is a convergence series for z large. Um, De Bruyne established the convergence, and Comte identified the coefficients as Stirling numbers. So it's actually kind of neat that I get to write an asymptotic series as a convergent series, because it is. Um, I'm going to skip the most famous application. The most famous application is the iterated exponential. Uh, so if anybody wants to know about that fractal and about the z to the z to the z to the z in there, talk to me afterwards. Uh, but that's actually why Lambert W is popular. Uh, we were listed, the, the early version of the paper was listed in the frequently asked questions list on psi.math.symbolic. And so the paper went viral before going viral was a thing, which I find is, is kind of fun. Um, the reason I want to uh, skip ahead... That's too heavy. Use this one. Right. While I'm on the subject of series, I want to give you one I call heavy sides despair. So if w of x now, e to the w of x equals x, and this is now a principal branch, and x is bigger than 0, then I can take logarithms without fear. The unwinding numbers are all 0. So um, log of w of x plus w of x is equal to the log of x. I'm going to flip that around. Okay, so that's w of x plus log of w of x. But if x is positive, then w of x is positive. It's the only branch. So log of w of x, I can, I can reuse the formula. Instead of log of whatever, I say it's w of whatever plus log of this thing. Well, if it worked once, do it again. We proceed by induction, and we say that this is equal to the sum from n equals 1 to capital N of the nth iterates of w plus the logarithm of the n. This is the same as the last term in there, but now we take a logarithm. This provides a beautiful asymptotic series for log. Logarithm is asymptotic to w of x plus w of w of x plus w of w of w of x plus absolutely glorious asymptotic series. I call it heavy sides despair because this series is divergent, but we still can't do anything with it. For those of you who know the heavy side quote that goes the other way. Um, the reason, there are two reasons why this is a silly asymptotic series, if we throw that away. The first one is, why would you replace a nice function with a more complicated function? You can't, is the, is the answer. The second thing is, the next term is like log log, so it grows very, very slowly. And the next one is log log log, even more slowly. So these terms are ridiculously slow in, in uh, uh, being an asymptotic series. It just I don't know of any asymptotic series with slower paced gauge functions. But anyway, it, it was fun. Um, now I promised Oleg a sum formula. Surprisingly, this sum formula came up in a PhD thesis defense 
uh, last month at Western. And so in statistics, uh, people are talking about random levy processes and uh, 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 the concept of something being harmonically convex came up. And so it actually has a consequence for uh, W because that's harmonically convex. Uh, So let wj of a plus wk of b be something. Let's just call it c. So this is a perfectly de well-defined complex number. a and b are fixed complex numbers. So c is a fixed complex number, so it occurs somewhere in this region. So this is in the range of wm for some m. Which, if we know what C is, we can conclude what that M is. That's a definite M. Consider uh, C e to the C. And I'm just going to write Wj plus Wk instead of Wj of A. And now I use, I pull out the wj and wk, and I say wj times e to the wj, that's just a. wk times e to the wk, that's just b. All right, so c e to the c is equal to this thing. So c is wm of ab, 1 over wk, of b, plus 1 over wj of a. This formula is not mine. I've, the original version, just with no branches, just for the positive real branch, was on the Mathematica functions page, right? Not MathWorld, the functions page. We don't know who invented this yet. We're trying to find out. Uh, well, I like, suspected it was Jerry Kuiper, but we don't know. But it's kind of a pretty formula. Log of something plus log of something is log of AB. Well, W of something plus W of something is not W of AB, but it's close and asymptotically correct. I have time for the integral now. Uh, might need the unwinding number yet. I've still got the rules underneath there, don't I? So if you look at the top of the poster, or near the top of the poster, you'll see a very strange integral. And this is the proof of that integral, which incidentally shows that w z over z is a Schelchitz function. That has a consequence for computing matrix values of the Lambert W, if you want to take Lambert W of a matrix, it turns out that for Schelch's functions, uh, you can compute them quickly through rational Krilov uh, uh, methods. The uh, uh, person who's uh, in charge of all uh, the high-speed computations there is Stefan Guttel. Uh, I won't give any references for the talk. You'll have to ask, ask me afterwards for references. Except I will mention the Princeton Companion to Applied Mathematics. Uh, I've shown it to some people. I have a copy of the Princeton Companion to Applied Mathematics here, which has got some uh, good stuff in it. Let's put it that way. Um, OK, the integral. But let's do it as a theorem. This came up because I was talking to Peter Borwin in the late 90s. And I had computed Padet approximates for Lambert W and noticed that the zeros 
and poles all lay on the negative real axis. And as I change degrees, the things interlace. I showed that to Peter, and he said, well, is W a Schelch's function? I said, I don't know, but maybe it's... A, he said, ask Dick Askey, he'll know. <laughs> well, in fact, W is not Schelch's. It's W Z over Z that's Schelch's. But that turns out to be just as good for the matrix computation. And uh, my student, my, my student with, together with David Jeffrey, uh, a man named German Kaljugan, some of you might know him, managed to prove many results uh, about W and its relatives. So he he's, was instrumental in two, I think, very nice papers on this. Anyway, but I'll just give the one uh, thing. Uh, I never did give the domains. I never did give the domains for these things. They're not the same. Uh, for k equals plus 1 and minus 1, we actually have a logarithmic branch point at 0, but we also have the... the uh, second order branch point at minus 1 over E, and for W0, there's only the branch point at minus 1 over E. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a contour around that. And let's just suppose Z is somewhere in here. And let's make that a radius R from the origin. Okay, so that's my keyhole contour, which is almost like a standard keyhole contour, except that the tip of the key is at the singularity at minus 1 over E instead of at 0. Keep that in your head. Cauchy integral formula says that this is true. Um, as I let R get big, the top uh, is like log, even out here. Uh, the bottom is like R, uh, like R squared. And the length gives me another R. So the total contribution from the part just in a standard way goes to zero. So all that's left is the integral along the top, whoop, all the way back. And the contribution from the singularity at the end is a branch point singularity, so it's nothing. So we wind up getting 1 over 2 pi i, which is integral from minus infinity to minus 1 over e, w0 of t over uh, t t minus z. And then coming back the other way, we swap the signs. So we get the integral of a branch difference. W0 of that uh, negative axis goes along here. W minus 1 goes along there. A little thought convinces you that the real parts are equal. So the difference between those two is just the imaginary part of W along the top, and that's already enough to show that W is Z over Z is Chelch's. We're done. But nobody likes to have a, an integral over a weird interval with an imaginary part of a function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change variables. I will change variables by this one. I will say let t equal minus v cosecant v e to the minus v cotangent v. Ah, it's not so bad. Let's call that f of v. dt over t is going to be uh, f prime of v over f of v dv. So if we take the log of this and differentiate it, we're going to be, because we've got a t. I've got a dt over t here. And k 
carrying out the details and simplifying it a little bit, you can see why I get uh, the Z plus V cosecant V e to the minus V cotangent V on the bottom. Uh, in the numerator, well, you can believe that all of the other stuff will just simplify away. I want to say one thing about that integral, and that is that Bill Gosper, when he saw the integral, said, who's Rob Corliss trying to kid here? Um, just you can't solve transcendental equations with with uh, integrals, and especially not ones that that uh, converge so slambangularly. That's the word he used, and I just love it. Um, think of the numericists. Anyway, <laughs> the integral on the on the poster is symmetric minus pi to pi, uh, and the integrand is infinitely smooth out near the the. There's essential singularities out there, but it's ultra flat. The trapezoidal rule or the midpoint rule converge sp spectrally fast in the standard terminology, or slambangularly in Bill Gosper's term. Uh, and I'm very happy with it. It's a, it's a very nice way to, to do the computing of Lambert W. It's not the first integral. Poisson had two. Seward and Berniston in the 70s had another one, which was not too different from this one, actually. Uh, and that's it. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, this talk is very interesting for me. Uh, and uh, I just want to uh, make a remark uh, that formulas with uh, function k when you use, uh, you can find uh, here uh, on the internet function site. Uh, and uh, uh, I am glad that you support our conception because not so many people uh, take care about the branch card and so on. And uh, our, our first paper was 1993 on it. So thank you very much. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we have uh, we discussed uh, in the morning uh, problems with uh, relation which you show here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, here. yeah. And uh, I show plots uh, of uh, this uh, uh, relation. And we have uh, domain in set quadrant where we don't know what to do. And you know that uh, you have solution for this domain. Right there. You might not like that solution, but it is the solution. You might say, I want to have a simple way to decide what M is if I'm given A, B, J, and K. I don't have a simple formula, but I do know that it is unique. M is a function of A, B, J, and K, and it is unique. Yes, and we uh, guess it will fill out the gap, I believe. That would be nice. Uh, I want to mention that uh, this function came uh, to Mathematica. Uh, it was about uh, 1993, uh, maybe. Or... In, in 1994, Conrad Wolfram met me at the ISAC uh, in Oxford and showed me Lambert W in the Mathematica at that time. Um, however, the name got changed because of a letter that Don Knuth sent before we had convinced him to join with us on the on the paper. So Don, at the time that he was speaking to Stephen Wolfram, wasn't yet convinced that Lambert W was the correct name. He later got convinced, but unfortunately, Stephen Wolfram and Mathematica are out of step. We have two entrants to this function currently. You can type the uh, log, uh, product log, or Lambert W. Right. Thank you. And Jerry Kyder, who tragically died in 19... That's a loss, yeah. Jerry, uh, he uh, suggested to implement this function, but I'm not sure that he derived this formula. Nobody knows who. I asked uh, Eric Winstein, and maybe he knows. It, it, I would like to know. That, that would be a good thing. Over. Oh. I wrote two articles... Uh, and applications of one that I statistics and going to go just because of this post. Wonderful. I, I, I am repaid. I am repaid. Thank you. Thank you.
There's more copies out in the coffee table. Take as many as you want. I've still got a stack this big. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.